Thank you, Barbara. Um, I want to apologize just a little bit in advance for um, needing to read portions of the talk that I want to share with you this afternoon. I know, because as is someone who likes to listen to talks also, that it's much more exciting if the speaker can move around across the stage. And um, when I talk about something that I've talked about a lot, I love doing exactly that. But the thing is that this afternoon, what I'm going to talk with you about is not something that I've talked about a lot. What I'm going to talk with you about is something that I have to say particularly to you. And I want to get my words just right because the topic I'm going to talk about is one that's very tender to my own heart and kind of hard for me to talk about, which is the question of why. Why, given all that I've seen and all that I've been through, why do I remain in Catholic education? A couple years ago, I don't know how many of you in the room will remember, when the third revision of the Roman Missal was coming out, and many of our very favorite and well-known familiar prayers were being retranslated in just slightly different words. And I remember at that time, one of my colleagues who's a, a choir director, he said to me, he goes, you know, I'm sitting up in the choir loft and I can hear like from below, half of the congregation is saying, we believe. And the other half of the congregation is saying, I believe. And he goes, from where I'm sitting, it just sounds like, why believe? <laughs> why believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Why believe in our Lord Jesus Christ? Why believe in the Holy Spirit? Why believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church? And I know that on one hand it's just funny. I mean, of course we believe we're sitting here today, aren't we? But there's this edge to our chuckles that's just this hint of nervousness because we do sometimes wonder why. Maybe more than we like to publicly admit. Why? Why, given all that we have seen, and experienced as church, do we believe? And why do we remain, not just as members of this church, but as workers in God's vineyard, even though the hours are long and the merit pay is non-existent? Why do you do what it is that you do? And if you were up here in my spot, you can see why you would want to be careful in choosing your words, wouldn't you? Because you'd understand how impossible these things are to talk about in a wider modern world. How fluid one's answers might be from day to day to day. Hard to pin down even for ourselves, never mind trying to explain them to others. Now we all know that the answer has something to do with the mystery of grace. Now, you knew I was going to talk about that, didn't you? Huh? You, got the, you got the flyer. You have the booklet in front of you. You saw the title of the talk. And I bet when you first saw that, you were just thrilled. Because really, is there anything better in the middle of a Tuesday afternoon than to come to a lecture entitled Embracing Grace in the 21st Century Church by a theology professor? And that's not the way that we ordinarily voice our why as Catholic educators, as teachers, as principals, and as superintendents in the form of the theological lecture. Because grace for us is not an idea that we sit around and ponder amongst ourselves using heady words like sanctifying and habitual and pervenient. Grace for us oftentimes we come to know in moments, moments that, that seem so tiny and so fleeting when they happen, but that feed us, 
for hours and days and weeks and sometimes even years later. And so this is the last time this hour that you're going to hear me say the words sanctifying, habitual, and pervenient. And instead what I want to do is I want to introduce you to the aptly named Grace. Now, I first met Grace somewhere around the year 1999. And not long before, I had completed a catechist formation course in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, which is a, a movement I know probably many of you are familiar with at this time. When I first started, it was brand new to me. And what it did was it turned some of my ideas about what I was doing in the classroom upside down. In the catechesis of the Good Shepherd, now be, be prepared to be stunned by my awesome artwork here. Um, when I first started thinking about classroom teaching, in my own imagination, it looked a little bit like this. But what catechesis of the Good Shepherd helped me to envision was that I, as a catechist, was really one that was sitting alongside the children, and that the teacher in this space was the Word of God. In Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, we create a space called an atrium, which in the ancient church, it's a term that we borrowed, Maria Montessori first began exploring using this term with children, um, based on her work in the early 1900s. And it was used from a term in the early church. It was the atrium was the space between the street and the worshiping space where the faithful would come and they would gather with one another to settle themselves and get ready to go into church and to worship. And what we imagine our own atrium spaces to be in catechesis is that it's a space for adults and children like that space in the ancient church where we can gather and settle and listen to the word of God to get ourselves ready to worship with one another. Now, in my own community, we decided to pilot an atrium in 1998. And at that point in time, Grace's parents were not members of our community. But they recognized Grace's innate religiosity, even from her infancy. And they wanted to find a place to nourish it, and so they came searching, and someone sent them in our direction. And I can remember the day when Grace's mom came for a visit for the very first time with her two-year-old daughter in tow who had big blonde curls and big round blue eyes. And they seemed to convey this sense of that everything in the world was new and was wonderful and strangely that maybe she knew of other worlds as well. Grace did not talk to me a whole lot during those years. But when she did, it betrayed to me how much she was absorbing. At our tiny little altar table, I would light the candles and I would say, Christ has died, Christ has risen. And beside me, I would hear Grace whisper, Christ will come again. Or sitting in front of our last supper work, I would announce that Jesus, on the night before he died, he took the bread and he blessed and broke it and gave it to his friends and said, this is my body. And next to me from Grace's tiny little frame, I would hear, this is my blood. One of the greatest insights that I ever had from Grace was when she was about five years old, and it was at this very time of year during the Easter season. A few weeks earlier, we had been reflecting on the parable of the Good Shepherd, and especially that line in the parable where it says that the Good Shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. The children had been very quick to connect this to Jesus' dying that he had loved his sheep so much that he stayed with them even as the wolf appeared, though the hired hand would have fled. He stayed with them at the cost of his life. And a few weeks after, I guess it would have been this week, we were reading with the children the story of how the tomb had been found empty. And I talked to the children on that morning about that Easter proclamation of the angel, that Christ was risen. And at the end of my presentation, Grace looked at me and she said, well, of course. 
Now, as a theologian, those are the moments when it's really tempting to be sarcastic and to say something along the lines of, like, you know, this is actually, Grace, the very first time this has ever happened in history, but we'll play along with it. I didn't say any of that. Instead, I just said to her, of course. And Grace looked at me and she said, the good shepherd loves his sheep so much he couldn't stand to be away from them. Now, I will say as a lifelong Catholic, I have long thought of Jesus as dying as a gift for us, but I never thought of his resurrection as just as much a sign of love for us. A couple of weeks later, we were um, sitting in front of a presentation on the Eucharist, and once again I was with Grace, and I was talking about how Jesus remains present to us in the bread and in the wine. Of course, Grace said, of course. The good shepherd loves us so much he couldn't stay away from us, Grace said. Of course. Do you see what I'm talking about? That these moments that happen that are so quick but that linger, moments that continue to feed us for days, for weeks, for months thereafter, moments in which I think that I'm here to teach you something about faith and actually I discover, oh no, it was you who was here to teach me something about God. Around us in the church that particular Easter, chaos was swirling. 9-11 was still fresh, fresh on our minds, and the sex abuse scandal was first breaking. Two priests from the neighborhood in which we lived were removed, rattling the stability of our Catholic school and the neighborhood as a whole. Who could you trust? What could you believe? And yet, this much was still true. Jesus died for us. Jesus rose for us. Jesus is with us. He is for us. That Easter, it was grace that held me in place. Now, we continued to build atria for the older children, in good part because Grace and the other children asked us to, and time continued to unfold, and we continued to ponder it together. And around the age of six, I had the opportunity to introduce Grace to a lesson called the fatuccio, which is Italian for a long ribbon. This ribbon is so long, 150 feet long, and each rib on the ribbon stands for about a thousand years in the history of God's work on our planet, the history of God's salvation for us. And I remember unrolling that ribbon into Grace's hands and the ribs just sliding over the palms of her hands, so many lined ribs spreading, going across time. And after, at the end, Grace said to me, I used to wonder why on my hands we have lines. I see now that it's because the history of the kingdom of God is placed, written by God, right on our hands. Now, I should say that the little girl next to her, Allison, stared at her own hands with great amazement at this point and said, wow, my uncle told me it meant how many boyfriends I was going to have. As First Communion drew nearer, we reflected more on those work of our hands and the way that that history of the kingdom of God, the history of salvation is imprinted on our hands and the particular role that our hands have in helping to bring about the kingdom of God. As First Communion drew nearer, we thought about how that bread and that wine had begun as wheat and as grapes, but had been transformed by the work of our hands into food and into drink. And that when we came to the altar and we laid that bread and wine on the altar, we then prayed that God would send the Spirit upon that bread and wine and transform it into God's very presence, fill it with God's presence in this world. And we spoke about how that bread and that wine, it represented all of the work of our human hands, all the ways in which we take the gifts of creation and transform them by our own work. 
And that when we put the bread and wine on the altar, it's a sign we're putting all of our work on the altar. And we're asking God, saying, we've taken this as far as we can go. Send down your spirit and transform it, permeate it, fill it, so that God might be all in all here. Now, I should add that as we were having these conversations outside of my classroom at the theology school where I teach, there were news vans that were parked. A Vatican investigation of seminaries had begun. In response to those initial 2002 revelations of abuse and having nothing to hide, my school had naively volunteered to go first. We drew immense media attention from all over the nation. Cameras, microphones, strange accusatory and polarizing kinds of questions. And I was barely holding on under all the stress of it all, feeling as if we were living under a cloud of suspicion, both by media and church officials alike. But then there was grace. In the first communion procession, we invited each child to carry up with the gifts of bread and wine some symbol of their work that they wanted to turn over to God and offer on behalf of the kingdom. And some brought their homework in the offertory procession, and others their piano music, and one their soccer ball. And Grace, Grace brought a sunflower. And when I asked her about it, she told me, it's because my work is joy. I offer my joy to God that it might be a gift for others in this world. What kind of person was I becoming because of my work? What was the work of my hands that I was bringing to the altar and asking for transformation? And could I tap into that joy? Did I have joy to offer? That Easter season, it was grace that held me in place. Our life in the atrium continued as Grace entered into her tween years. I'll forever remember one moment when Grace was around 11 and we were talking about the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Now, you know that one, right? How the master keeps going out time after time after time in the morning looking for more workers in the marketplace to invite into the work of harvesting his vineyard. But then at the end of the day, he pays them all one denarius, regardless of how long that they have worked. Now, there was a great debate going on in the children in the atrium about whether it would have been better to have worked all day long and got one denarius or whether it would be better to work in the vineyard of the Lord but one hour and get the same wage. And most, I will say, were thinking that one hour was the better deal. Um, it was interesting because I asked the children, well, what hour of the day do you think that you were called to work in God's vineyard? It's very interesting to hear nine-year-old children comment on this and say things like, probably the third hour or the sixth hour, some even the ninth hour of the day, as if maybe the sense of proportion in life has not yet sunk in quite. But then again, of course, there was grace. I am so happy to have been called in the first hour of the day, she said, so that I can spend my whole life in the vineyard of the Lord. And when she said that, she looked at me with these wide eyes, those same wide eyes that I had seen when she was two, full of wonder and delight, but also with this sense of puzzlement, like, why would anybody want to be anywhere else? Why indeed? The truth is, Grace, that working in the church as an educator has never been easy. The hours are long, the heat of scrutiny oppressive, weekends slip away and doors spent grading, lesson planning, bathroom breaks are few, lunches are rushed and they usually include recess duty, and don't even get me started on the perception that we have summers off. But it's also true, Grace, I did not choose this work, that it chose me. 
that I've been a teacher since my parents brought home my baby brother and I was still in diapers, that I've had that fascination with chalk since the age of five, and the smell of the mimeograph machine since the age of seven, and that at 10, it is true that I started summer school, much to the consternation of my siblings. And, but when my college students, or my college friends, when they were wondering what they were gonna do in life, I suffered no doubt that teaching was going to be a life full of meaning. The pay was low, but I never had to sit in the marketplace wondering, am I going to find work that feels like I get to make a difference? Yes, Grace, I admit it. I, too, am so happy to have been called in the first hour of the day so as to have as many years as possible in so magnificent a harvest. And the denarius at the end of the day, at the end of the shift, that's not why I'm here either. I think heaven's going to be great at all. But the reason why I am here, Grace, it's you and the other children that are in this space. Because for in you, I have encountered the face of God. And I can't picture my life without your insights, your wisdom, the way that you make me laugh, the way that you look at me with those eyes and make me filled with wonder and awe and see the world in fresh new ways that I would never see if you were not here and show me other worlds as well. Teaching's been the way that I get to rub shoulders with the divine on a daily basis. Now, I want you please to understand that I said none of this to Grace when she was 11. I just looked into her round blue eyes and smiled because that's what we do in moments like these when it's Grace that's holding us in place. And of course, it is not only the aptly named Grace in which I have encountered the face of God. I have been held in place by the mystery of grace in hundreds of students of every age over the past 25 years. Micah, James, and Shiloh, and Will, and Allison, who at this point I suspect has had many boyfriends, for she is a strikingly beautiful young woman. There have been Mary and Daisy and a little guy who shall remain nameless because my key memory of him is that he bit the head off of our Virgin Mary statue in the atrium. <laughs> and there are Brian, and there are Aspen, and a graduate student who shall also remain nameless because she never, ever managed to hand in a paper on time. And yet, she gave $5,000 to pay off the tuition bill of one of her classmates so that the two of them could walk down the aisle at the same time. And it's not only students, it's, graduate, it's, it's not only graduate students, it's colleagues, it's mentors, people who have been grace, who have held me in place. In Redeeming Administration, I reference several amazing administrators that I have had the opportunity to work for and with over the years who showed me how to maintain a sense of balance in the middle of long hours and endless grading. But toward the end of the book, I mention a colleague from another institution who in the book also remains nameless, though probably shouldn't have. I mean, it's not like she bit the head off the Virgin Mary or anything. Her name is Zini. And once when she knew that I was going through a particularly rough time, not as a teacher, but as an administrator, she sent me a card with a quote from Carl Sandburg that read, if I should pass the tomb of Jonah, I think I would stop there and sit for a while because I was once swallowed deep in the dark and I came out alive after all. It touched me so deeply that I framed it and I kept it in my office and I would read it on a weekly basis because Zini was about a generation older than me. The good news is she still is. And she had an administrative position in her institution that was really similar to mine. 
And every time I thought of her, I would feel encouraged because she'd been in this field a lot longer than I had, but she still seemed to be finding so much life, so much light in the work that she was doing. And every time I'd look at the card, I would think to myself, well, if Zini can keep doing it, I can keep doing it. And so once, shortly after I had looked at that card and had had that thought, the two of us had the opportunity to be at a conference with one another, not unlike this one. And we had the chance to go out and have breakfast with one another. And over a stack of pancakes, this was my big chance. I was going to get to ask Zini the secret sauce, the source of her hope. And I said, Zini, what is it that keeps you going? that sustains you in the work that you're doing. And without missing a beat, she said to me, oh, she said, oh, that's easy. Whenever I start to get discouraged, and I sometimes do, I just turn around and I think, there's younger women out there like Ann Garrido, who seem to be finding a lot of light and life in this work. And I think, well, if she can keep doing it, then I can keep doing it also. And I thought at that moment, though once again, this was not something I said aloud, oh, that's bad. <laughs> I thought, I'm here because you're here, and you're here because I'm here. And God, that is a very fragile structure upon which to build your church. But when I got home from that conference, and I was sitting at my office, and I was staring at the picture again, and I was trying to reflect on the experience, what I came to realize in that moment was that the church is not a building. And it's not even primarily an institution that we work for. The church is a network of relationships that holds us in place and that has for 2,000 years. And if it is true that God is Trinity, because I still do believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, then what that means is that God in God's very being is relationship. And relationship is the structure in which we all move and breathe and have our being. So I'm here because you're here and you're here because I'm here. This is not a fragile structure at all. It is the structure that undergirds the whole universe. It is the strongest structure that there is. And I suppose all of this is a very long way of getting at one point and one point alone, that the mystery of grace is the mystery of relationship. And it's our relationships as educators, electric with new insight, and these moments of surprise tenderness, and big blue eyes of wonder and awe, these are the things that hold us in place and give us the why always have, always will. And embracing the mystery of grace in the 21st century means embracing the person who's sitting next to you right now, who in ways that you might not have even considered until this very moment has been one of those people in this huge network of grace right now holding you in place. And that's true, even if you don't know this person from Adam, or in this crowd, more likely from Eve. And I want you, just for a moment, not to say anything to them quite yet, but just to nod at your neighbors and to let them know that you see them, that they are here. And moreover, every single one of those people that you are nodding at right now has stories of other graces beyond those in this room that have held them in place and sustained them, or they wouldn't be here right now. Now, your neighbors, they may be hanging on only by a thread. You yourself might be holding on only by a thread, but I'm looking at you, ain't I? You're here. 
And it's only because grace is alive and active in your life as it is in theirs. Earlier this month, when I was a bit stuck on what I might say to you today, I put out a call on my Facebook page and I asked my friends who are Catholic school teachers and um, catechists if they would just tell me about a moment of grace that had in this, just this past month had reaffirmed their vocation in Catholic education, reminded of them as a why as an educator. And I had barely hit post when the first one came in. And I woke up in the next morning and there were already more than 30. And I heard from David, who is a catechist in Texas, who thought he might be getting kind of old to be teaching teens confirmation anymore until two of those teens let him know, no, he was right where he needed to be. I heard from Anne Marie, a principal in Ohio, who last fall um, was hit by a car and broke her femur, but reported such support from her students and their families and her faculty that when she came back, she came dressed as Mary Poppins to let them know that they were practically perfect in every way. <laughs> from Anne in Missouri, held in place by a child who told her that the atrium was a place that she could be with her mom and feel her mom's presence though her mom passed away last summer. From my cousin Joey in Las Cruces, New Mexico, who I haven't talked to in years and who isn't actually a Catholic school teacher or a catechist, but saw it and wanted to just write about what a blessing the Catholic school in his area had been to his own daughter and their family. I even have a friend who wrote me from Australia. And I could keep these coming, and I will, but more important, what I want to do right now is I want to invite you to turn to one of those people that you nodded at. And I want you to ask them to tell you of an event that's happened in their life, maybe just even in recent weeks, a grace from this past month that reaffirmed their own call to the work of Catholic education. And we're going to take about five minutes for this conversation. And then, in a very teacherly fashion, I'm going to ring this. Right, and we'll call ourselves back. But turn to one person next to you and share a story of a grace in your life.
Oh, wow, we're good. Um, the energy and the light that comes forth, you can't probably feel it in the same way I can from seeing it up here. But there's such a light and an energy that these kinds of conversations spark inside of us when we begin to tell those stories. And one further possibility I would just say is that if you're willing to share a name and an event that has been a real moment of grace for you and has sustained you, held you in place right now, uh, that I would invite you to share that, to post about it on your own social media and to hashtag it so that the rest of us can be encouraged to hear some of the other stories that were being shared in this room as we spoke. When I watch the energy with which you tell your stories, one of the things that becomes so clear to me is that without a doubt, grace continues to abound in the 21st century church not because of our excellent organizational or administrative record, but because we are a community that's repeatedly blown away by the wisdom and the insight and the laughter and the kindness and the holiness of God that's present in the face of each other and in the students that we serve. And almost daily we get to be surprised by some manifestation of that divine that's alive in the living, resurrected body of Christ. But as our reading of today, I was thinking about this as we heard the gospel proclaimed this morning, and it reminds us that we can't cling to the living, resurrected body of Christ. That these moments that we've been sharing with each other, they come, but we can't freeze them. We can't preserve relationships in formaldehyde. We can savor them, we can delight in them, but then we have to hold them with open palms. In the spring of Grace's sixth grade year, tears began to flow on a regular basis, eking out of the corner of her eyes, because there were only a few weeks that would remain until Grace, quote, graduated, from Atrium. We only work with children usually up to the age of 12. And she would say, but this is such a special place. I've always found God here. And I would say to her, but it's time to move on. There's more of God to discover, I said. And Grace nodded. There was hesitation on her part and there was hesitation on mine. And do you think you'd want to be a catechist, I said? Yes, she said. In seventh grade, Grace began coming to catechist training one Saturday a month. We started a special teen track for all the children who'd been all the way through the atrium and wanted to remain involved. And that first year, the other teens, after that first year, the other teens decided that they weren't going to go on to the next level. But, I mean, they continued to help out in the atrium. But Grace was the only one who decided she wanted to go on the only 14-year-old sitting in a room of, a whim, of women 40, probably our average age. And two years after Grace left the atrium as a child, she was confirmed, a time in which our parish welcomes teens to get involved in the ministries of the church. And so Grace, needless to say, was once again in the atrium each week. And she and I worked with each other but the group of 9 to 12 year olds and a third catechist, the aptly named Hope, but that's another story. <laughs> but at the same time, what happened was Grace's questions started to change. She began to ask the kinds of questions that all teenagers ask, at least all thinking teenagers. Is it really true there's a God? Why is there so much suffering in this world? What do I believe? Why believe? And the things that Grace had received simply and unquestioningly as a child, she began to be troubled by. And seeing Grace struggle made my heart melt. But that gift that she had given to me as a child, Grace began to receive as a gift herself from the other children that we dwelt with. And that hope that she'd always offered me, she now received. And with the children that we worked in the atrium, she would say to me, they help me keep connected to what's really essential. 
The closing years of high school got really, really crazy busy for Grace. ACT and SAT prep, advanced college courses, prom and ring dance, and the first real boyfriend, and she was no longer able to come to the atrium regularly. And those years also got crazy busy for me. Not that they had not been crazy busy before, but this was different. My husband took a new job in another state that eventually necessitated me leaving the atrium and my administrative role in the theology school. And I was able to be at Grace's graduation from high school. But then, other than loosely spying on Grace from afar via Facebook, Grace and I lost touch. I could see that Grace had joined a sorority and seemed to have really great friends. I could see that she learned how to scuba dive. I could see that she got to spend a semester abroad traveling in Ireland and, and France and Florence. I knew she was majoring in psychology and sociology. I knew that her concern for justice and for service remained a part of her life, as did sunflowers. But what I did not know was what Grace was doing with all of her challenging questions and how Grace was doing in terms of faith. Many times I thought about reaching out and asking, but I said to myself, I mean, like what really? What really busy college student wants to hear from their old religion teacher? Honestly, underneath, I think a part of me was nervous. I've read the statistics from Going, Going, Gone study that came out in 2017. And I know that 36% of young millennials between the ages of 18 and 24 claim not to be affiliated with any religion whatsoever, including an increasing number of Catholic youth. And I knew that the sacraments are not an insurance policy, that among former Catholics who are now disaffiliated with the church, six in 10 made their first communion. And many of those who do continue to self-identify as Catholic only participate in Eucharist a couple of times a year. So part of me, I think, didn't really want to know. I guess I wasn't quite sure what I would do if I discovered that I'm here because you're here, and then I find out that you're not really here, at least not in the same way anymore. And then this past year, the church experienced yet another round of shock. It's not as if I can't see the long arc of justice or that where we are in history right now is just a moment in time. My faith in God, the Father Almighty, and in our Lord Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit, and in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, it's not a wispy one. But I'm also tired of half-truths and facts that are kept hidden. As someone who's part of the public face of the church, I get tired of feeling like I have to explain the inexplicable and give excuses for behaviors that are inexcusable. And in a nation right now that is swollen with lies, I should like my church to be an exemplar witness to what truthfulness looks like, not part of the bigger problem, Exhibit A. This is already such a hard place to be that embarrassingly, it made me even more hesitant to reach out to Grace even though I know it's her senior year of college and that she'd soon be graduating. I wasn't sure I could deal with whatever sorts of questions that she might want to ask about the recent revelations. And I wasn't sure I could handle it if I found out that she was gone. I mean, I guess I would deal with it, but it would be discouraging. And it's way more consoling to me if I could simply hold on to beautiful memories I have from the past. But one can't really long for truthfulness in the church, can she, without being willing to hear things she doesn't want to hear. And one can't really give a talk about embracing grace in the 21st century church, can she, without looking for grace. So with some trepidation, I tracked grace down. And we talked. And I think it would be better if I let her speak for herself. 
crazy. I'm just so excited that we get to talk to each other by video, even if it's not quite the same as face to face. Um, and what I guess I was wondering about was given that now you are right on the edge of college graduation and about to um, enter into the world as a <laughs> contributor in the, in the workforce and bringing all your gifts out into the world. Um, when you look back at your own time um, in faith formation as a child up through your teenage years, what kind of memories do you carry with you now from that past? Um, I have a lot of really, really good memories from my faith formation, especially in the atrium. I, I remember a couple of works in particular. I remember the workers in the vineyard. There were just- I remember about that one because there's not a big material that goes with it, but I remember talking with you. Yeah, I remember because it was like a big, I had like a big discovery at that point with workers in the vineyard. Um, so we were talking about like how um, some people were hired to work all day and some people were hired just for a little bit, but they were all paid the same. Um, and I remember you just like asked the simple question of like, what, like, is that fair? You know, like, what do you think those people would feel? And like, some people would be like, yeah, obviously like angry that like these people who did less work. But I just remember thinking that like, if they were in God's, if, it, if this is God's vineyard, they get the joy of being there for longer. It doesn't matter, you know, like how much you're paid in the end. It's just like you got to be there longer. Um, I've always like held on to that. Well, and it's kind of funny because I actually have held on to that moment also. I remember doing that meditation with you and the other the other children in the group. And I remember because it was an aha moment for me that I I remember you talking about that you were so glad that you were called in the first hour of the day. Yeah. That you felt like because you didn't have to discover God later in life, but that from the very, very beginning you'd had a relationship with God and that that was something that you realized there was a joy in the work. It wasn't just because of a reward at the end that God was going to give us, but there was a joy in the work itself. Yeah. In the relationship. Well, and I'm curious as you begin to head out into the workplace now in your own life, um, whether or not you still feel like that's true, that the work that you're about to do that you're already engaged in, is is part of the joy yeah I oh it's absolutely part of the joy um I think that's something I've always felt privileged is just to have had such a strong faith from the beginning of my life um I feel lucky because like I joined my faith at a really good time to where um I got the most essential things which is that God loves you you, it's a joy to like be in relationship mm -hmm. with him. I think, I feel like I've always been called to help people. So um, I'm excited to kind of bring that along. And I think it's, there's truth in enjoying the work. Yeah. What, I mean, I, I, for me, ending college was just a really, it was a challenging period in my own life. And I'm wondering what is holding you in place right now like what do you feel are the supports or the comforts that are around you that's keeping you strong in in your faith and your personhood and your in your vocation yeah um i actually have good friends and we pray together um which is really really beautiful um and it'll just like it'll it'll even be like if we eat together to if somebody is going through a hard time we'll just like hold hands and pray and that's a beautiful thing um and then also um I I really personally see like God through like nature and beauty in general and so I have a couple of spots on campus that I like to go to um where I can just go and pray and be quiet and still and um 
One is the library steps because you can see beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Um, so I go there sometimes if like I'm having trouble. And then the other one I probably shouldn't go to because it's like kind of <laughs> not where I should go, but um, it's the top of the football stadium um, at my school. And so um, it's beautiful because it's like higher than everything else and you can see everything. Uh -huh. It's just really beautiful. And so sometimes I'll go there if like I kind of need a boost of faith. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, nobody will know after, just because you said it here. Nobody will find that out. <laughs> hey, so tell me what, given your own background and where you are right now, what would you want to say to people who are working in Catholic education whose call is to teach? Yeah. A, a ton of things, because I, I know that... Um, Things are hard right now and probably seem discouraging. Um, there's a lot of, um, I mean, no institution is without its issues, of course, mm -hmm. but um, I can say that like from my experience, like being educated from a Catholic perspective has changed my life. Um, I don't, I'm so grateful for it, um, and I, I just can't imagine my life without it. So for those people who are discouraged, again, I think I said this a long time ago, but keep going. You guys um, have really, really changed my life, and I know countless other people. Um, so I can't thank you enough for all that you do. So there, you heard it straight from the mouth of grace. You're not allowed to call it a day and collect your denarius quite yet. Are you surprised to hear that this Easter, once again, it's grace that holds me in place? No, at this point in time, you're probably not surprised by that at all. Grace has told me that after graduation, she's moving back home She'd like to start helping out in the atrium again. And we would obviously welcome her back. But perhaps more important for our purposes here, I want you to consider for a moment the goodness of a God who gifts us with moments that are so fleeting but so impactful, who reminds us what's essential who invites us to trust each morning that, like manna, we're going to have enough insight, courage, energy needed just for that day. And who says to us each evening, don't worry, there's more where that came from. Who has promised never to abandon us, but to always be with us and for us, most especially in the face of each other. God never tires of giving, says Teresa of Avila. Let us never tire of receiving. And here's where I close. Let us never tire of receiving grace. Let us never tire of welcoming grace. And let us never tire of wholeheartedly embracing grace in the 21st century church.